All right, so we could do a quick review because it's very short. So Tilm 120, day two. Shira Malos, a song of the ascent or a song of the stairs, either referring to the songs the Levim sang on the stairs or um, Sadi Gon says the song of crescendos is that you go louder and louder and louder as you as you go on, or if you're going to do the whole midrash for the David raising the waters, which we're not touching. Okay. Uh, to Hashem, El Hashem betzarasali karasi vayaneni. In, to Hashem in my many distresses, I called out and he answered me, or he will answer me. Hashem hatzila nafshi misafas sheker milashan rumiya. Hashem saved my soul from lips of falsehood, from a tongue of deceit. Ma yitin lacha, ma yosif lach lashan rumiya. What does it give you and what does it add to you for you, tongue of deceit? Chite gibor shenunim im gachale rasamim. Sharpened arrows of a warrior with coals of rotem wood. Oyali ki garti meshech shechanti im ohle kedar. Woe unto me for I have dwelled in meshech uh, or or I've dwelled at length. Uh, I have uh, resided with the tent of Kedar. Rabas shachna la nafshi im sone shalom. My soul has resided at length in it with a hater of peace. Ani shalom, I am peace. V'chi adaber, but when I speak, or according to the Targum, when I daven, himala milchama, then they are for war. Okay, so our observations were basically <laughs> war things, deceitful speech things, and grammatic grammatically, aesthetically, and thematically disjointed, right? So we said that if there is going to be a pivot, maybe it's in the middle, but we couldn't exactly see why. It does seem to flow a little bit. Like you start off by asking Hashem for help. Then you say what Hashem, uh, what you're asking for help from, which is deceit. Then you elaborate on the tongue of deceit uh, uh, and its harm. Okay, then there seems to be a break. I have dwelled in Meshech. I have dwelled, resided with the tents of Kedar. That's something about his residence. And my soul has resided at length with the hater of peace. This is now going back to the war thing. And I am for peace, therefore war, right? So not much to work with in terms of like the divisions. Okay, so then we did, okay, we asked uh, several questions. What is a shir amalos? Uh, how is this a shir? It seems to be um, bakasha, right? And shir seems to be shavach. Um, and uh, where was he living exactly? When did this happen? When did he write it? For how long? Who's the speaker even? Uh, and then how do Gimel and Dalit fit in? Uh, they seem like they're making arguments. Yeah. Uh, I have a new question. New question. I do too. Okay. Good. Go ahead. Um, I have two new questions. So what is the effect that the falsehood is going to have on his soul? Like he's asking him to save his soul from lips of falsehood. From yeah. Deceit. What's that negative effect that's going to have on his soul? Okay. Question, one question. Okay, so let's put this here. So in Hasuk Bet, um, what harm to his soul is he asking Hashem to save him from? Right. And also, Hasuk K starts like, woe unto me for this is in the situation that I've been. What's the idea of saying woe unto me? That's a good question, like, also. Yeah. Isn't complaining a bad thing? Right. <laughs> in, as we talk about five, he, he exclaims, uh, Oya Lee. Okay. Um, to what end, right? Uh, this, this doesn't, this seems more like a Bakasha, uh, sorry, that like a complaint than a Bakasha, like a complaint bad than a Bakasha. Good. Right. Yeah. Okay. I have another question, which I don't know if this is a good one. Doesn't this kind of have not a happy ending? Like, I feel like a lot of the Tehillim like results in some sort of that we've done results in some sort of like, like capping it off with some sort of like call to action of praising God or trusting in God, or it's all going to be great. This one is just like, he starts off talking to Hashem, asking him to save him and you don't get to see the ending. I mean, you see he, and he answered me, but it doesn't seem like that from the parak, right? Where, where do we see Hashem answering him? Well, and then maybe that's actually the better way to say it. Depend on how we interpret Pasuk 7, the last Pasuk, like, what does it mean that he is peace? I mean, that's such a weird possibility. Right. That is true, right? We can't fully ask what does the ending mean if we don't know what the ending is. But yeah, so um, uh, he says that Hashem uh, answered him or will answer him. Uh, but where is that in the Perak? Okay. To the contrary, uh, the Perak seems to end off on a negative note. Why is this now? Displaying. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions come up since? Uh, yeah. Just 
as far as reading it, and this may be what you're asking, you said, who's the speaker? I mean, it seems like there are a few things that it's not clear who he's addressing it to. Like, what does it give an uh, email? Yeah. What does it give you? And then also at the end, they are for war. Yeah. Um, um, no, okay, so we, I forgot to mention this when I was going over the facts. So what does it give you could either be that he's talking to the tongue. Okay, it's like a poetic, like Hamlet only he's holding a tongue instead of a skull. Um, and, or the Targum had said, actually, you know, let's just look at the Targum on the one we did last time. Oh, <laughs> um, oh it's the season. It's the good ice cream truck. It's the good ice cream truck. I ice cream on the girls. <laughs> okay, good. All right, nice. Wow. Okay, uh, kind of, it's, it's a relief, it's a relief. Yes. Let's hope the other one has its sound parts destroyed. I'm not gonna say the guy goes out of business, but let's hope the sound parts are destroyed. Yeah, so obviously it's not gonna be around for a This one is playing music too. Well, this one's Jewish guy's Matthew. He's oh, okay, this is not Jewish, sorry. That makes sense why his song is not <laughs> heresy, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, if it were Psuk, Halavai, it would be Psukin, as long as it's not um, whatever it is. Right. Okay, yeah, the abomination, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> have you not listened to the episodes of the Stoke Your Podcast about me dealing with the ice cream truck? <sighs> okay, yeah, yeah, that's important. It's important for your perfection. Okay, um, yeah, okay, so uh, going back to what you were saying, so he adds in ma, oh, actually, we have our English here. Ma yahev lach malshina, what does it give, he give to you, O slanderer? Uma yosif lach achil kurzi. Uh, and what does he add to you, O oh, defamer? I think uh, gossiper is a better translation. Lishana nechilta. So he's talking to the people who use the, de the uh, deceptive uh, tongues, and he's asking, what does it give you? Mm -hmm. And our question on that, which we did answer from the Meiri, the question is, what do you mean, what does it give you? Like, it allows you to destroy people, <laughs> you know? Like, it's pretty good, you know? Yeah. Um, so I had a new observation. Also. Okay. Um, if we could look at the Pharisees. Yeah. Um, that and there's like some parallelism between our first half and second half. Okay. Because he said he asked the gem to save his soul from the lips of falsehood. Yeah. And then in the second half, his oh. soul has resided. At, like, you know, there's yes, his soul has been in this bad situation. Okay, that's a good uh, good parallel. Yeah. And again, you know, with uh, ordinarily, uh, you would say that like, so what? It's just like he's using the same word twice, but in such a short parak, you can assume it's a parallel. I think. I think it's like a, a reasonable assumption. Yeah. Also, I don't know if this is like a, any sort of methodology kind of thing or anything like that, but it's in the second and the second to last. Yeah. I don't know if he's trying to like make like a, what's it called? A, um, uh, classic, like, oh. like thing. Well, you do need more than one element to be a chiastic. No, no, I know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, you, oh, I see, you're saying this is the second and then second to last. Yeah. Okay, I see what you're saying. Okay, yeah, that's true. Well, one other thing I noticed, by the way, um, uh, Rabba Shachna La Nafshi Im, maybe this is just an obvious point. I just didn't notice this literally until just the second. Um, Rabba Shachna La Nafshi Im Sone Shalom. They hate peace. Now, when you read that, you think they just hate peace. Then he says, Ani Shalom. Mm. So they hate peace and they hate me. I am peace, right? So it, it, it's it, it's just an interesting like uh, equation of uh, of the peace with him and their hatred. Like that sheds a new light on the hatred, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that regard, it's a little weird. Like, why are you going to people that are going to hate you, man? Well, is that why? What? Why are you going with people that are going to hate you? That's another good question, right? Why are you going with people who are going to hate you? Yeah. Okay. I mean, you're like saying, like, things are not going well. Well, I think there's a. Yeah. Fix why is he not dueling, dueling well, with people who hate him? Maybe, I don't know. I mean, like, I don't want to well, answer questions. Yet, yeah. But, like, these are other nations. Aren't they? Uh, okay, so the, so you got to remember, living. David is, is coming from a beginner's mind perspective of not having heard the other uh, here. <laughs> so we know that this is about other nations. Oh. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Shh. We'll, we'll review that in a second. Yeah, what were you going to say? Oh. Well, I was saying, it's like he's in a situation where he couldn't just like. That's. He's saying, well, one for me. Okay, so that's the other option. You that's. Know, say like, oh, I'm stuck in this chair. <laughs> yeah, right, okay. Okay, good. So I think that's actually going to be the key because we said it's possible that this is talking about other nations. But it's also talking about David himself. But I think that's that's going to be the answer. Okay, so let's do uh, let's review the Meiri and then finish the Meiri and then and then crack it. Okay, okay. So uh, quick review of the Meiri. We're not going to reread it. Um, okay. So he said the Shir Malas introduction part. We we already summarized that. Okay. Next, he says the Kavana of this Mizmor is um, that it is. Uh, okay, I, I lied. We're going to reread some of it. 
Sorry, so this is his theory on Shira Malas in general. The majority of these are about the pains of, uh, of Galus and the prophecy about redemption from them. Yeah. On that, so I'll say this early on that I didn't want to say it because it was like we don't have enough information yet. But based on this, can you say the reason it's get answered at the end is because he hasn't gone through the trial yet? Yes, I think you could say that. Uh, I didn't yeah. Tell him, I didn't think I had enough to base it all. Yeah, no, no, it, it, it's good. Yeah, I actually have an interpretation. Uh, uh, that is even more localized, but I think that is a reasonable answer, which is we don't we, we've only read chapter one out of 15. Yeah. OK, um, so and so uh, all the more so about this long galos of galos Adam. Mehem. Some of them are about the sorrows of David personally and his trust in God. Even though he speaks from the language of the people who are in exile and their trust in God. So you can either learn this as about Gullus, sorry, about uh, B'nai Israel and Gullus, and they're speaking naturally, or it's about David in his personal sorrows, but he's speaking as if he is B'nai Israel and Gullus. Okay. Um, okay. And then he says, Vizem is more Efshar Shiamur al Asma or al Gullus. This Mizmor, it's possible to say about himself or about the Gullus, and he's going to explain it both ways. Okay. So, I cried to Hashem and he answered me, so that is uh, plain and simple. Okay. Uh, in my distresses, in my many distresses, so he says that uh, the Sfas Sheker and Lashon the false speech and deceitful tongue, Ne'emarim al-Hasonim han misnachlim, are said about the enemies who are plotting. Alav o al Galos, either about us, uh, David, or about uh, us in Galos, with with uh, smooth talking. Okay, so it's, that's both. All right, and he'll elaborate in a second. Okay, then he says, um, what, what does it give you and what does it add to you, O deceitful tongue? Klomar, mi yachrichacha lahalim levavacha. So this is now in talking about if it's about David, who compels you to hide your heart? To the point where you look like a friend. And then you reveal your hatred at the end. It's not benefiting you at all in the deception of your, your uh, lips and the smoothness of your, of your statements. Okay, so hold on to that. And if it's about Galos, Yomar Zeh, this is, uh, he's saying this, Al Hamasimim Vagolim Alino Tamid Alilos Tavarim. These are about the people who are constantly trying to plot against the Jews, Besheka or Vamirma, in falsehood and deceit. Mi Blishi Agim Bezet Toelis, without them re, uh, getting any benefit from it. Rak Lakvanas Nezak Levad, they just want to harm us. Okay, so we gave examples of this is like the the vicious anti Semitism and blood libels. They're not doing it to make a quick buck off the Jews. They're not doing it like because they are getting paid, you know, whatever. They're, they're, they're getting um, some sort of like tangible benefit. They're doing it out of hatred. Okay, so same thing seemingly with, uh, with David that he's saying, like, why are you doing this to me? You're just being like, you know, vicious. Okay. The last puzzle we read last time in the Meiri was this one. So, so um, sharpened arrows, umalutashim, me'atman. They're sharp in and of themselves. I don't know exactly what that means. Viotim gamkein miyad gibor, and they, oh no, they're sharp in them, themselves, and they're being wielded by a warrior. Shememisim b'chidu chadus v'lo b'hergesh. They pierce you uh, with their sharpness without you feeling it. Okay, so the example of this is uh, that we gave is like the uh, the woman in the store who got stabbed and didn't know it, or um, this is just we were looking this up. Can that happen? If you get stabbed with something uh, sharp enough, then you don't necessarily sense it. The other explanation I saw somewhere is um, if you're in war, mm -hmm. uh, the adrenaline is very high, and that can prevent you from feeling the pain until like you can, you know, like the hero always like defeats the bad guy and then looks down and like he's been shot a bunch of times, and then he you know, then he dies, you know. Um, uh, and then Gahali Rasamim are um, are coals that when they're extinguished outside, they're still burning inside. And Rasam, when you see them, the guy who sees them, Yaksho Shem Kavos Lagamre, he thinks that they are completely extinguished. Lokham and he grabs them, the Inu Margish, and he doesn't sense it, Aju Nikbebehem, until he's burned by them. So the commonality is these are both ways of getting hurt where you don't realize you're getting hurt until you've already been hurt, like until it's too late. Yeah. The, the hurt we're talking about is talking about the hurt that the Jews get from the deceitful words or the hurt that the deceitful speakers are getting from the uh, That the Jews are getting or the David is getting. 
Yeah. So with David, it makes sense that these guys are betraying him and he doesn't sense the pain until after their plots come to fruition. And then with Jews, I guess these people are spreading all of these things about the Jews um, and it doesn't uh, necessarily have an effect until like later on. Like a good example of this is the Nazis um, spread a lot of propaganda over a very, very long period of time or anti-Semites at least. You know, it's not like just one day they got up and decided to Holocaust. It, it was, see, the, the culture was steeped in it, you know, and I'm sure many Jews just were like, oh yeah, okay, fine. They're just talking, let's just talk, you know, and then boom, you know. So, so according to you, this isn't like explaining why there's no like benefit to the, to these things. They're just explaining why they're like very harmful to the Jews. Correct, yeah, yeah. The last one was saying that there's no benefit. This one is saying how they harm, uh -huh. yeah. Okay, now we switch gears into Meshech and Kedar. Okay, Vamar, oily kigarti meshech, woe unto me for I have dwelled in meshech. So zek kashe lafarish imhu nemar al asmo. This is difficult to explain if it's said about David. Okay, why would it be difficult if it, uh, to explain about David? Yeah, apparently he, David did not live in Kedar and dwell in meshech. Okay, um, so um, what was that? Why is Kedar so familiar? I don't know. Okay. Um, the Efshar Ledechak. Yeah, I don't know. I only know it from this puzzle, I think. The Efshar Ledechak, Kishahaya Gola Hena Vahena Bimakumas Agoyim. It's possible that um, he just means I was exiled all over the place. Okay. Vlakach Meshach Vakedar Bimakum Kulam. And he's saying Meshach and Kedar in place of every, in place of all of them. So Alter has a good thing on this. Uh, he, he says similarly, he says, uh, these are two far-flung locations. Meshech is to the extreme northwest in Asia Minor between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. Uh, it is mentioned in the Table of Nations in Genesis 10-2. Kedar is to the southeast in the Arabian Peninsula. One might wonder about the history of peregrinations of the speaker, like we did, but because it seems unlikely that a single person would have sojourned in both these places, it may be plausible to understand them as metaphors for living among people who behave like strangers, even if those people were within a stone's throw of Jerusalem. As someone today might say, I felt as though I were living in Siberia or Timbuktu. <laughs> okay, so in other words, he's just using examples of like far off places you know uh not that the guy that the speaker actually lived here okay and he says the speaker because i think it is unclear you know uh, this one does not say mismer david right so anything that doesn't say i guess it's a mock is about like do you assume david wrote all of them or just the ones that say david you know and then maybe these were written by other people yeah moshe we i think we do know which ones were written by him 90 through 100 i think so yeah yeah um, uh, that's what I think. Well, 90 we know is written by Moshe because it says it. And then I think Hazal, I think it's a Gemara. Yes. Says that it. I think I got lost there. Yeah. Maybe it's through 99. I can't remember. Okay. Anyway. Okay. So that, that that's why he says that it is uh, difficult if it's about David or O Amar Garti Meshech means Baham Shechusu Zman Rav, or it means I dwelled for a long time. Okay, I think he doesn't like that because Meshach does seem like a place. Okay. Okay, Im Ole Kedar. Now here, here's where it gets a little spicy. Uh Lifamim Baolim. Oh no, not yet, not yet, not yet. Shahisi Lifamim Baolim Shabadrahim. I was sometimes intent on the paths. Shame ke ole kedar, that they are like the tents of Kedar, Velo Avo Bayer, and I didn't go into the city. So again, he doesn't want to say that David lived in Kedar because he didn't. Okay. So he's saying basically like. I couldn't enter into the city because I was being persecuted so much. So I had to like live in the tents on the side of the road. Okay. Now he says, Vakarov Lafarsho, the more probable explanation is Lafarsho Aha Galos, is to say it's about Galos. The Nemar Besefer Yosef Ben Gurion. So Yosef Ben Gurion was a historian, not to be confused with Josephus. Okay. These are two ancient historians. Um, I think, I think one of them was after the other. They weren't contemporaries. Okay. I don't remember who was first. <laughs> Uh, Al Meshech, Shuhu Eretz. You want to take a guess at what this is? Tuscany. Tuscany. Nice. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Like yeah. So, so Toscana. Is, so they think it's Tuscany. Okay. Um, but here's the difficult part. Okay. Uh, oh, and the one who agrees with this is if you look at Al Hatora, um, the, where is it? Oh, I'm already here. I meant to click here. Um, oh, remind me afterwards to tell you the exciting new announcement from Al Torah. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, Toscana. So Rabbi um, 
not Norman Lamb, Rabbi, Rabbi Strickman, Norman Strickman, um, says uh, that it is, where did it go? Five. Five. Uh, that it is probably to Tuscany. Okay, so we're not sure, but it, it does sound like Tuscany. Okay, so then he says, um, uh, oh yeah, the Torah This this is uh, uh, Meshach is one of the um, descendants of Yefes. Okay, in the Torah, Vihi Ata Mimahus Edom, and now it is in Mahus Edom, which is Rome. Okay, Bamahus Makum Haemuna, in the capital of their of the location of their faith. So you think it's the Vatican, right? So then I started asking around, like, is Vatican in the Tusca in, in Tuscany? Okay, no. So here's the thing. So modern day Tuscany is on Google Maps, a three hour drive from the Vatican. Okay. So then I was asking about a bunch of uh, a bunch of people um, who know stuff. So I asked, uh, in, I asked my peeps. Okay. So first response I got was from Rabbi Donny Klein, who's the guy who translates the Shadal. So if anyone knows Italy. <laughs> he does. So he says, Toscana is the Italian name for Tuscany. As far as I know, Rome was never part of Tuscany proper, but maybe Toscana was being used here as a generalized term for Italy. Okay. Um, so that's, that's one possibility. Uh, and then Adam Avivi, right? Our, our, our summer program friend. Um, that's his last name. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so he says Tuscany was not, he's also a history guy. Tuscany was not really a political unit at the time. It was questionably part of the Holy Roman Empire, which was undergoing a temporary collapse at the time of Meiri's life. So maybe the Meiri saw it as the most religious part of the empire. The Tuscan merchants generally supported Gulfi, who were opposed to German uh, Holy Roman Empire noble influence, and the noblemen were Ghibli, Studio Ghibli, who supported the German <laughs> nobles over Roman influence. It is also possible that Miri saw Tuscany and Florence as the capital because the florin was the standard currency throughout the Western world at the time. And then Adam's brother chimed in, I'm texting me over WhatsApp. Yes, the Tuscany of today is not in the papal, papal states, but territories can shift like Iberia. What they knew back then as Tuscany could perhaps be different from what we know today as Tuscany. Um, to which I responded, in my ignorance, uh, papal shift sounds like a good dance move. <laughs> but um, yeah, so the answer is no one really knows uh, like what Tuscany is, but I feel like if you're gonna say Tuscany is um, Italy, it does make sense that he's referring to the Vatican because the Vatican has been around for a long time, you know, as the capital of the faith. Okay, however, there is a, another manuscript. If you look at footnote 17, Pixaviad uh, something days, Constantina, which is, uh, that's the guy, and the city is Constantinople, right, which was another capital of the faith, uh, so we don't know, <laughs> okay, but that's, that's the research that I got, <laughs> okay, which I did not do, all right, anyway, yeah. Um, what's the Meiri? I lost like what he was saying about this. Yeah. Place. So he's saying that. Um, yeah. Good. 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 Good question. <laughs> he's saying that um, Meshech is uh, is the capital of of the faith of Rome. Uh -huh. Okay. And Kedar, Rome is El Al Hayishmaelim, is an allusion to the Arabs that everyone seems to agree with because Kedar is in the Arabian Peninsula. Okay. And then he says, Vihisker Elo Hamachios, it mentions these uh, kingdoms, Ki Rov HaGalus Benehem, because the majority of the Gallus is among them. Is Kedar Qatar? Uh, good question. That might be where I'm getting it from. I don't know. I don't know what the etymology of uh, Qatar is. Because I know that like the Kuf is like a Q. It's right. In a, in a, in a, right, like yeah. Qatar. Qatar, yeah. 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 It's a, actually, if, it's a, and if you pronounce it like a Zal, it's also then. Mmm, mm, conspiracy. Mm. Armchair analogy. Okay. All right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Qatar really comes from Keter, which means crown, because they were the crown of the Roman Empire. Yeah. That's armchair analogy for you. Yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> and Katoris, because they could have been as fragrant to God if they stayed in the ways of Amram being from Ketura. Oh. <laughs> Easy to come up with these theories. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> so he's saying basically that that um, if this is about Klal Yisrael, then it means they were in Gullus and all of these from, you know, basically the Gullus was divided between the Arab lands and the Christian lands. Okay, uh, of Israel. Onifarish Gamkein Garti Meshech, or you could explain Garti Meshech is Shina Asisi Ger Be'eretz Acheres Meshech Zman Be'orech Es. Or it's not talking about Meshach as a place. It means I was a stranger in another land for a very long time. 
Okay. Vagam kin rabas yore urechzman rabas. What do you say? Rabas shachna la nafshi. Yeah, rabas is also means a lot of time because the tav b'makom hey. Um, okay. Klomar urechzman shachna nafshi im sone shalom. I I dwell for a long time with those who hate peace. Sorry, with he who hates peace. All right. Okay. Then the end. The inyan ani shalom. Rotelomar ish shalom. So ani shalom means I am a a man of peace. And when I speak peace, then they are for war. Yeah. Okay. Oh, by the way, just to recall uh, in the Targum, the Targum also mentioned that he added the word, uh, that's not the Targum at all. He added the word with, um, so he mentioned the Arabs and then he says, uh, more than these, my soul abides with Edom, the hater of peace. So he also put in Edom there, even though he didn't interpret Meshach as Edom. Yeah. Okay. So now we are back to the parak, and we are now at the theorizing stage. So let's just quickly review again. So we have calling out to Hashem in distress, save my soul from lips of falsehood, tongue of deceit, who is either people pretending to be David's friends when they're really they're his enemies, or it's people spreading slander about the Jews. What does it give you and what does it add to a tongue of deceit? Because these guys are like taking advantage of David uh, to attack him or it's people uh, uh, slandering the Jews just because they want to harm them not for any tangible benefit. Uh, the sharp arrows and coals of rotten wood are things that harm you, uh, but they seem like they're like you don't sense the pain at first. Woe unto me, I've dwelled in Meshech uh, so, and resided with the tents of, tents of Kedar. So either David saying, I went all over the place and I couldn't go into the cities because people were persecuting me, um, or I dwelled a long time. Or if it's about the Jews, it means we were all over in the Christian lands and the Arab lands, uh, or we were strangers for a long time. Uh, and the people who dwell with hate peace, and I am peace, but when I speak, then they are for war. Or with the target, when I dive in, then they are for war. Okay, theories. And again, we are trying to do... Ideally, the main idea of the parak is our prior top priority. Second priority, only because it comes after that, is what's the purpose of it? How is this supposed to affect us? Okay, I, I, we can't usually get that without the main idea. Um, if we can explain um, in uh, in detail how each puzzle contributes to the main idea, that's a good way to test the main idea. And then, um, is this true? Like firsthand. So that we're going to rely on that unless, you know, because Devin knows more about Hashkafa than we do. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, we can, we can still question that. Yeah. Um, so maybe this is the, according to the Gala's approach, yeah. that the main idea of this film is actually that, like, there is a danger in Gala's and you shouldn't believe sort of the, the, the false cases that the other nations are, like, putting out there okay basically like like getting people to be aware that there's like a danger like he's asking him to like save his soul from like you know the falsehoods that these people are creating because they're they're so dangerous they're like yeah. sharpen arrows and poles yeah they're like actually really hot when you touch them yeah so i think that he's like telling the rest of the jews who are going to be in dollars that like know that there are these real dangers out there and that what your enemies say are not like when they sound like they're being peaceful they're not necessarily peaceful okay so it's definitely good muster that we get from that uh, about being uh, aware and on guard against these enemies my only problem with it is that this seems to be addressed to hashem as a bakasha you know so so if you can work that that's not an intrinsic problem but like like i think at the end of the day we have to tie this back into a bakasha to hashem so how is that going to uh enhance the bakasha you know i think so this is a good like first step but yeah and you're taking within that bakasha there will be things that david on his own will do to repel that or not um like with what i was saying that like once you notice that yeah i think you could like you'll be more on guard like once you like you start to notice this a thing and then starting to like actually like verbally express it and now i start to be more on guard right like that. okay so that's definitely true but we also have to remember that what we learned in tehillim 28 oh uh, you know this is actually Tehillim 28 according to the malbin uh that we were doing uh 28 malbim yeah. um so this was on the pasuk of all 
Right, so also duplicity. They speak peace with their friends, but there's evil in their heart. And the Malbim said, "Why is it Elecha Hashem Ekra? Why is he calling out Hashem? Ki neged haoyev hanistar kasha yosher lihishamer mipanav. With a hidden enemy, it's very difficult to guard against him. Varach Hashem hayodeh hanistaros who rav lo shia neged elech horshe rav beseiser. Only Hashem who knows hidden things and who's abundant to save." can oppose those who plot evil in secret. So it's not that it's impossible, and I'm sure he is going to take precaution, but uh, there's only so much you could do, you know, uh, with uh, an enemy that uses uh, these disguises. So I'm, 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 I am agreeing with you. I'm just saying, like, like you know, um, the uh, it's it, it, this kind of enemy, it just happens to be very, very difficult to, to do that with. Yeah, Jeff? So maybe based on what you're saying, this is why we need a Bukasha action. Oh, okay, that's he good. You have to ask Hashem, like, while we're in Gauls and our enemies are around us and, and like, you know, like, uh, they're looking nice, but they're really bad. Yeah. Like, keep us from getting harmed by those enemies. Like, okay. It's a request. That, yeah. You know, Okay, that's good. That's we're good. We're gonna be right. around them, and we're gonna unfortunately right. be living with them. Yeah. Okay. Well, so <laughs> you can feel it now, right? Yeah. yeah. So I, I think, yeah. You know, something? I think if you combine this now with a Kiva's uh, move, which is our question of like, well, why can't you just get out of here? Well, if you're in Galos, you can't just get out of here. Or let's say if this is talking about David, why can't he just get out of there? What do you mean? Right. I'm not sure what point of his life is. I mean, he's the king. It's he's the, the yeah. King. Either he is the king or he's going to become the king. Or you know. I don't know. Could be right. Know. Yeah. I mean, the, but the point is, is that like at any point in David's life, except perhaps when he was a shepherd, you know, then he has this like role to play, and he can't just like abdicate. Mm-hmm. You know, he's not um, what's his name, Edward. Was that the guy who advocated? <laughs> Whatever. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, I think it's actually easier about uh, about the um, the Gullus thing that we can't just. I, I not fine. Now we're living in an era where there is a state of Israel, right? Uh, but there's also deceivers and people there, you know, that harm us with lies. But you can't just like get out of your Gullus and escape these people. Okay, so I think let's let's you know now combine these things and see if we can get like uh, uh, all the pieces. Right, so what do we have so far? We have calling out to Hashem because these are hidden enemies. Okay, and uh, there's one more important move, by the way. I'm, I'm just like uh, leading up to this. Um, and then there's the fact that uh, that yeah, they're using they're, they're wielding deceit, uh, and they can't um, you can't necessarily spot them. Okay, we haven't really explained why he has to say, so, what does it give you and what do you gain from it? Um, and then he says, we are, he, he specifies we're dwelling among these people and woe unto us. We haven't explained why he has to say woe unto us, woe unto me, right, or us, if we're, talk, we're talking. And then we haven't really talked about the hating of peace and I am peace and they are for war. Like that, that seems like an important factor. Okay. Yeah. No, go ahead. I have, like I've been thinking about it. Um... Since we've been going on lines of it's a bakasha, I don't know if this is going to work. Mm-hmm. But I've been thinking about the flow of the parak, and to me, it seems like so he's 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 definitely talking about this thing, right? This uh, the 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 deceiving thing, and that uh, we need God to help us with it. Yeah. Right? And then it seems that he's he's saying what it is, right? He says what it is, and then he describes. And then I, I, actually, I, I want to say that three is like a is like a is like a question. Yeah. Like. But I mean, obviously, the question. But not that it's like that. It's he's talking to the audience, and he's it's almost like rhetorical. He's saying, "What is this thing?" And he goes, "This is what it is. It's something that's gonna hurt you before you even know it." Mm-hmm. And how do I know that? Because I've dwelled in these kind of, mm-hmm. these kind of people, and I've you know, I mean, I mean, he's not really saying that you know, <laughs> that he's he's got hurt. Maybe mm-hmm. I could say that like the last passage is kind of saying that. Yeah. Um, and I was like, six is kind of like helping that, but then it's kind of then turning to the whole peace thing, um, which is that like, don't think that if you like show a good face and like you are faithful to like the, the good, then like, then, then it'll automatically be fine when you're adults. Okay. Um, even when like, 
you know these things and you know yeah. they're the tongue receivers and you know they're out to get you whatever it's like and you think it's okay i'll just extend the olive branch yeah it's like no like, you need god for that yeah you know? okay all right good okay so right. yeah you want to add to that i guess i guess so just like i think three and seven are kind of both highlighting like the, the degree to which these people are like evil yeah and he actually does need help from the shem in order to like be saved from these people like like when he tries to bring up peace, they always just they don't they don't accept peace and they always yeah. continue war. And when he went and they continually go for the deceit, even though it doesn't like do anything for them. Yeah, you know. Okay, like there could be peace if they accepted the peace of God. Right. Basically. Okay, so let, let me. Uh, I'm gonna now uh, invoke Ken. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna try. I always try to express this the way Ken does because he puts it so eloquently. And I, if I fail, then like uh, this is my fault. So the way he tied all these things together was, um, uh, I mean, we came to this idea together, but Ken just has a way of the words. So he says, the, this is a bakasha to Hashem to be saved from a culture of deceit and hatred like Lishma. Okay. And so in other words, it's if these people were doing this for a gain, so then you can bargain with them. Right. And you could say, well, okay, I'll give you this thing and then you leave me alone. Right. But no, they're doing it even when there's no benefit. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or if they were, if you could leave, so then you wouldn't have to turn to Hashem and ask him to save you, but you can't leave. You're stuck here, you know? And if, and because it's a culture, because this is the nature of these people, you can't ask Hashem. The, the, the question Ken asked was, uh, why doesn't he ask Hashem to like help him do tshuva? The answer is you can't, isn't there a puzzle talk like, can a leopard change its spots? Like, you can't ask Hashem to change these people. This is how these people are. And the example Ken, Ken gave is like, when you're at the mouth of a volcano that's erupting, you don't ask Hashem to stop the volcano. You ask Hashem to save you, you know? So that's what it is. And then the, the clincher is, uh, is he says, the way, the way Ken said it is, like, you know, you there's this latent assumption that people really want peace. They don't want to be at war. But what, what Dove says at the end is, if even if I were the very embodiment of peace, they would still hate me, you know? So there's no talking peace with them. So it, it, it has to be that the only way you're out, you can get out of this is Hashem. And that's what makes it a bakasha, is realizing that there's no other avenue except to turn to Hashem. And I, th I think, I think uh, the, uh, the answer about you haven't seen the end of the pair uh, of the Shira Malas yet is a good answer. But I think that maybe you can also say that the fact that the pair does not end on an optimistic note is because we're still in the Gullahs. Mm -hmm. You know, Hashem has not answered this one yet. So it does not end off with Hashem answering it. Yeah. Well, I was going to, and maybe it's a little bit different from that, is that maybe the why it says what we want to meet is because he's, it's like a, it's like a limited precaution. He's not asking for Hashem to save us from Gaulus and, yeah. and, and bring us out of Gaulus. Like he's asking like in a more local, like, wow, we're still in Gaulus, protect us from. Oh, that's interesting. Harm. Okay. So I am, uh, okay. Yes. Yeah, so those are, those are two directions we can go. I was assuming that he's saying Hashem saved me from uh, Gaulus. And the reason why I want to, uh, mm -hmm. I'll support that with the observation you made is Hatila Nafshi. And it's the Nefesh that has dwelled with these people. So, like to me, he's the, saving the soul means make my nephesh not dwell with these people, uh -huh. you know, not protect me from these people. Like, you know, like in the last period we did in, in 28, it was like be a shield for me and a fortress for me, which sounded like protection from the harm. This sounds like the only way out is 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 to is to actually be removed from Gallows. And I think because it's a ubiquitous problem everywhere he goes, it, there's the, just this driving hatred that's going to be through lies, and you have to get out of that. Now, the practical takeaway from here, okay, obviously this is relevant to us when we're in Gullus. And by the way, I think it's actually, um, I think we are at a severe advantage, disadvantage, okay, because, um, uh, okay, I'll tell you that and I'll tell you the grim thought, okay. So we have really, including me, uh, who is older than you, have grown up in the time of the world where the world has been the most at peace like, I don't know for sure in history, but pretty good run, you know, and we have not experienced the type of anti-Semitism that like most Jews have experienced in most places. So for, for people like us, this is a very, very, very tame version of what would have been life or death daily matters in other places. And I, I had this thought, I'm going to, because it's relevant, I'll, I'll say it now anyway. So I read over, um, 
what's it called? Pesach. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, that holiday, I reread Victor Franco's Man's Search for Meaning, uh, which, which I only had read in high school. I hadn't like, you know, very good. And so, you know, the first half of the book is his experiences in the, the camps, right? So what I, what I was thinking about, and I don't know if you have a different view of this, when I think of Holocaust, uh, of people in concentration camps, I think of people who are old now, who were young when they were in concentration camps, right? Because all the Holocaust survivors you meet are old now, and they were young when they were in concentration camps. He has certain descriptions of like 70 or 80 year old, year old men in concentration camps. And I was thinking to myself, like, take the ages that we are now, right? Like between 20, 20 and 40, you know? Can you imagine, like, take the life that we are living right now. Can you imagine if 40 years from now, we're in a concentration camp? And that could be, like, for all we know, we just, like, we, we got very, very, very fortunate to be in this era where it's not that bad, but this is just, like, a brief lull in the ongoing storm that has been going on for millennia, you know? And, like, to get to the end of your life, to have gone through your life, and I'm sure, you know, they had anti-Semitism growing up, I'm sure. But like, for us, it's going to be even worse, you know, to have grown up in a world without this type of anti-Semitism. And then in a matter of years, it could become like, you know, uh, like the worst of the worst, you know. So that's what I mean by saying we're at an advantage because we have grown up in peace. But we're at a disadvantage because we have a hard time relating to this. And as a result of this, Gullus is a comfortable place, you know. And in fact, if you talk to most people who make Aliyah, then, okay, I haven't done a survey, but most people I've talked to, it's because of positive reasons that they want to go to Israel. It's not because life is so threatening here that they're fearing for their lives and they have to take refuge, you know? Um, now in post-World War II Europe, it was, that was the case, you know, but like, so the point I'm making is even the people who are attached to Israel, who, who, who make Aliyah there, I would say they have a very hard time relating to this because their experience in Gullus was not every single person is lying to you to just try to harm you, you know, unless they're from like, you know, certain places like, like, you know, uh, Jews who came from really anti-Semitic places. Yeah. Um, so, so certainly as a takeaway for us, like this applies to us, but we have to work at like, at, at recognizing the potential for this kind of harm. So it's very, very hard. But I, I, what I'm looking for is, is there, are there tefillah strategies in general that we can get from this, you know, um, a, 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 as opposed to like, particularly asking about redemption from Gaulus. Like this as a model of Bakasha. Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, like we said, like, especially the whole ending, not really wrapping it up in Bakasha, yeah. is just recognizing there's only one answer. Um, Big no. general and yeah, it. right. So I think that's it, right? Is that that um, the the fantasy that I'm asking a shepherd help, but I can save myself or I can turn to these other people. I mean, it's a fantasy because even if you can turn to yourself and other people, that only works if Hashem allows it to, you right. know. So like that's a fantasy. But so the 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 way to really have a good bakasha is to recognize Hashem is my only. My only hope. Now, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean you're passive, but it, that is the case, yeah. There's a good bracha in Shemona Esrik to tie that to, which is the third bracha, the Shem is Kadosh, meaning, because you gave us right. about the three different That's types true. of ways people can the Rashba. request, yeah. and how none of them apply to a Shem. So the right. third one was that people could ask someone in a way where it's like, oh, maybe they are able to help you, maybe they're not. Yeah. So Shem, or like, maybe I could go to someone else. Right. But, or maybe a Shem, but, but no, right. Shem is the only person you could go to. Exactly. Like that we did when that week you were over Pesach. Yeah, it was the same, yeah. same Shuva. Yeah. 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 Is the, the, the Rajba. It was yeah. the Rajba. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I, uh, I, I noted that, that we did it and then like the Rajba did it. Yeah. 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 Also, I am just knowing that he is not only sitting where he wants to get to, he's also sitting like the opposite of what to move away from. Yeah. And, you know, I think there's also funny thing that um, we will be related to a three to one from today from uh, James Carroll. So, but like, what's like remove and like what to get away from? It's yeah. Not just only what to move toward. Right. But in that scene, what to get away from. That's true, also, right? So, in other words, the more you recognize the, um, the threat and the harm, 
you can't ask Hashem Hatzila Nafshi if you don't have a clear idea of what you're being saved from, right? Yeah. Uh, before I call on tomorrow, I just one more point before I forget is the uh, I think the there's only one way out. I think that's what the oily is doing. Oy comes from oily comes from this feeling of absolute hopelessness. So it is a he's not complaining. He's acknowledging the dire reality of his circumstances that there's nowhere else to turn. Yeah, tomorrow. Um, did you say that there was an opinion that this was being said on, on the steps by the base of Mikdash? Yeah. Okay. I, that seems interesting with this interpretation. It is. Yeah. That I feel like we do have to wait a little bit more to be able to form a theory about why this was said on the Mikdash. It doesn't seem very happy. You know, what was that? It is said on the first step. It is said on the first step. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I would think so. Yeah. Now, the the opinion that we read that does make sense is that this is being said during Alila Regal, right? Because then you're moving out of Galus. I mean, not necessarily out of Galus. You could be in Eretz Yisrael also, but like you're 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 retreating from places that are subject to this kind of thing. Um, there's one other thing in terms of the it being our only hope, Hashem being our only hope. It reminds me of the Perak in Hallel. Where's Shomer Pesayim? I think this is our shot on Shomer, Shomer Pesayim Hashem. Uh, so the que- the problem is, so Pesi is a naive simpleton. Kuf Tes Zayin Vav. Hold on. Tehillim 116. Um, oh, that's not the right thing. Oh, it is. I was doing the right. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, so Kuf Tes Zayin uh, 17. No. There's a, six. Thank you. Um, Shomer Pesayim Hashem Dalosi V'li Yehoshia. Hashem protects the simpletons, and he uh, um, and I was brought low, but he saved me. So the question that we had, and I, I had for a long time, was God doesn't protect Pesayim, like, or he shouldn't protect Pesayim. Pesayim don't have, why Pesayim don't merit Hashgah, seemingly, right? Because they are lacking perfection to merit the Hashgah. So why would Hashem, and yeah, this is saying Hashem protects them. So I think the Radak is the one who said this. Shomer Pesayim Hashem, Amar HaPesi She'en Yodea Tachbulos Lihinatel Mitzara. So the Pesi doesn't know any strategies to get out of his own Sara. HaKel Shomer, therefore God will protect him. Kishemesim Allah Bitchon, when he places his trust in him. Okay, so so he, he's saying that the Pesi does have one thing going for him, which is he doesn't know any other strategy. So it's very easy for him to put all of his trust in Hashem. And there is a Hashgacha for that. But then he says, The Chacham should not trust in his Chachma and his strategies. Because they will not benefit him if God does not approve. Um, but he mentions the Psalm because they don't have any other way. So this is, again, another disadvantage that the Chacham has. Because the Chacham is a Chacham and can see different possibilities, it's more tempting for him to feel like there are things to rely on other than Hashem, whereas the Pesi only knows that he can rely on Hashem. So the Chacham has to basically not make himself into a Pesi in terms of his like ways of thinking. <laughs> I was I was raising my voice like Jeremiah to try to drown out <laughs> the talk. Um, uh, but he has to, uh, the, the Chacham has to like, even when he sees other strategies, make himself like a Pesi saying that these strategies will not work if it's not for Hashem. Yeah. Okay, so I think we figured it out, right? Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, so the takeaway, um, yeah. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, I have one more point. Oh, no, no, go ahead. I'll remember it. Okay. Uh, just going back to like, what I was trying to say before, do you think of that, that, like, that works at all? Or like that, a lot of it is, if it's for the goals, then it's like, I think it's even going to but that it's, as a whole, it's telling you what to look out for and how he knows that. I think that's a side benefit. Uh, like, uh, I think, first of all, most Jews will be aware of this. What we said about, like, throughout history. Here. Yeah, here, yeah, we're in an anomaly, though, you know. But, um, but look, you look at the... Um, um, do I have to pause it so I don't get demonetized? Not that I monetize anyway. But, uh, no, like, you look at the, you know, the halachos. Like, it's us to get... Uh, I mean, I, I don't know if everyone possums like this, and clearly today we don't. So also, to get a haircut from a non-Jew because he'll slit your throat. Right. 
that was a thing that happened. Like, like, you know, and he might be a nice barber, but you know, so like uh, it, all the, it was a much more vicious world. Then I don't think David's audience then had to be told mm -hmm. by the way, guys, non-Jews, they're out to get you, no. you know? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Reason? No. Okay. Uh, the other thing I was going to say for tefillah strategies is now that you know this strategy of Bakasha of realizing that Hashem is your only hope, you can then apply that to other sorrows in your life, especially ones where like, it's very clear that there's no way out, you know, like there are cases where, you know, you, uh, uh, are, whether it's sickness or financial loss or like, like, you know, um, horrible tragedies, like the only way out is Hashem. And that if you dive in with that in mind, that is an actual reality. That's a reality all the time, but the sorrows make you force you to realize it. Yeah. Okay, um, we are done with this for now. Uh, and I'd like to move on to the next parak next time. We, do we want to do an initial reading now so, we could, so it could percolate or do we want to save it? Okay, so let's do an initial reading now. Uh, let us save as 121 translation. Translation. And we will change the number. Uh, and oh, did I save this one? Okay, uh, whatever. Um, okay, then let's go to the next parak, also short. Um, copy and paste. Okay. Um, oops. And white. And okay, let's go. Oops. Okay, I'll delete everything else later. Okay. Uh Shirlam Lama Alos. Oh. Is that because he's going up? He was on the first step and I just step. No, I don't know. The rest of them would be Shirlama. That's true. No, maybe the first one just to show you the motion and then you know inertia one is in motion, he stays in motion. <laughs> the last one has to be Shir has stopping malos. Yeah. It's a song to a sense, right? Or two stairs. That makes less sense, right? <laughs> but a sense. Okay. All right. Esa enai el heharim me ainyo avo Lift my eyes to the mountains. So I lift my eyes uh -huh. uh, to the uh, the mountains. Me ainyo avo From where does my salvation? Or uh, let's use let's you from let's whence? use whence. whence. Yeah, whence does my salvation help come? Alive. Hence will my help my will my help come? Will. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ezri meim Hashem. My help is from Hashem. My help is from Hashem. And mi'im means from, even though it's a weird way to say it. O sage my The maker? Yep, maker of the heaven, uh, and heavens and earth. Uh, and the earth, yeah. It's like, he's, my help is from Hashem. Who? O sage my Um Okay. Al tit yitain la mot raglacha, al yanum shamracha. This is a weird one. Don't give your legs to stop. Yeah, I, so I think it means falter. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll we'll check uh, alter later. Uh, do not uh, allow my foot falter, to falter. Al yanum. Your foot. Oh, your foot. You're right. Yeah. Like I guess. Oh, that's weird, though, right? Well, then to not do you, you are right, but <laughs> no, that's not the weird part. Is why would we even indicate that God's foot could falter? That, that to me, it does not seem an appropriate yeah, marshal. Yeah. Let's see how they translate it here. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. Huh. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. So he's saying, he will not. All yitain. So he, yeah, yitain here means will allow. He will not allow uh, your foot to falter. All yanum shomrecha. Um, uh, don't, you don't rest your guard. Like, uh, so I, I think is your... Your guardian will not slumber. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and then it it, it, it re, uh, extends it into a principle. Hine lo yanum lo yishan shomer Yisrael. Behold, he does not slumber nor sleep. He neither slumbers nor sleeps. He right. Not slumber. <laughs> no. uh, the guardian of Israel. the guardian of Israel. Yeah. Um, was that a specific imitation or just a general like? Okay, yeah, yeah. No, just, I too was moved to say in in you know an old English thing like that. Okay, Hashem okay. Shomrecha. Hashem is your guardian. Hashem, I, I think this is a verb. Hashem guards you. Oh. 
I think. I, I don't know for sure though. We'll find out when we look at the Mishnah. Silacha al yadi minacha. Oh yeah, uh, Hashem. Yeah, Hashem silacha al yadi minacha. Hashem. Uh, so I think this is like sale. Is yeah, it shades you. Um, al yadi minacha. Uh, uh, well, this is your right hand, right? Yeah. Yeah. Let, let's just see what it says here. Um, make sure we're doing it. Uh, uh, the Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. There you go. Uh, the Hashem shade you upon your right hand. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm picturing a person like lying out at the beach with like an umbrella that is just <laughs> putting shade on their right hand while they get like sunburn. I, I, I think there's a better, there's probably a better way to understand this. Um, okay, uh, six. Oh, did I, oh, your right hand, thank you. Um, hand. Uh, Hashem, oh, yeah, Yom HaMashemesh Lo Yakecha V'yarech Belayla. Oh, so that addresses my, uh, my, uh, my imagery. By day, the sun will not strike you. Okay, I think Yakacha is like Maka. Um, via Reach Belayla, nor the moon at night. You know, you gotta hate those moon burns. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, that's a great video from my town of that there was a heat wave in Israel. So yeah. We did a whole like satirical, satirical video about putting on sunscreen and whatever the during the night. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> really that's funny. funny. Uh, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> that's funny. I mean, it is weird though. Like, what is the moon going to do to you? But whatever. Yeah. Hashem, unless you're a werewolf. Hashem from Yishmar Hamikol Ra, Yishmor Es Nafshacha. Hashem will guard you from all evil. And you evil. from all. Uh, so you could say evil here. I would definitely be inclined to say harm, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, all harm. Yishmor es nafshacha. He will guard your soul. Um, <laughs> don't tell the Abraham now. Hashem yishmar tzeischa v'uacha me'atav yad olam. Hashem, yeah. Guard your leavings and coming. Your leavings uh, and, and, and yeah, yeah comings. Uh, it's, it's the other order though. Um, yeah, me'atav yad olam. From now and. Until forever. Until forever. Uh, until forever. Okay. Yeah. So here is a very clear theme, right? What would you say the if in one word? What would you say the theme of the parak is? Guardian. Guardianship, right? Because he uses the term. Uh, let's see here. We have uh, one, two, three, four. What? <laughs> Five. Uh, oh, yeah. oh, oh, and seven. Okay, yeah. Oh, I forgot that with a trump, it um, it makes it uh, hard to get the whole word. Yeah, and then you know, and even in vav, it's like implied shmira. You know, right? Yeah. So this this one, the theme should be fairly easy. Um, yeah. So uh, I guess the question is gonna be like, what are all these ideas? And I feel like also this. The pivot is very easy here, right? What would we say the pivot is? Yeah, the first pasuk and then everything else, right? The first one is a question and the rest of it is the answer, right? Um, where does my help come from? Uh, it's from Hashem who does all these things. Yeah. Oops, uh, yeah. Okay, so we're, we're, we, we can think about this now, right? And uh, yeah. Okay, good. Good, good, good. All right. So we might finish this next time. We'll see. All righty. All right. Have a good night. Thank you. Yep.